Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's quite all right. It's all high. right. Okay. And anytime you're ready. Welcome to the home of retired Justice Hugh Arthur Evans, who uh, reserved, uh, served on the Court of Appeal 3rd Appellate District for almost 16 years, from 1974 to 1990. I'm Art Scotland, presiding justice of the Court of Appeal, 3rd Appellate District, and I had the pleasure of actually appearing before uh, Justice Evans when I was an appellate lawyer and then serving with him on the court for a while before he retired. Hugh, it's uh, great to see you. It's nice to be here, Arthur. Thanks. Hugh, uh, as part of the uh, Judicial Council's uh, Appellate Court uh, Legacy Project, uh, we are recording uh, and compiling a historical account of the life and experiences of uh, retired justices and also uh, going to seek your insights on how uh, the courts ran in those days and mm -hmm. uh, changes in the courts. Uh, it's going to be kind of like the old uh, TV show, This Is Your Life, <laughs> but you're going to have to tell it. All right. So shall we get started? Let's do it. All right. Super. And I go to edit all this. Justice Evans, if you could give me your name and spell your last name. Yes, my name is Hugh Arthur Evans. My last name is spelled E-V-A-N-S. I was born July 5th, 1922, in Ogden, Utah. Is that enough? Yep, pretty good. And just a second, let's hear what. Now, if I'm, since I'm sitting so close to you, you want me to talk? Please. All right, you ready for me on my voice and all? Oh, yeah, let me hear you talk just a bit. Just okay, a Hugh, you're 84 years old, still going strong. Still doing everything but run. <laughs> all right, is okay. that good? We're all set. All right, ready to go? Yes, sir. Hugh, you're 84 years old and still going strong. You've had a very interesting and full life, and we're looking forward to hearing about it. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born on July 5th, 1922. I missed being a firecracker by about an hour and a half, <laughs> uh, according to my mother. And uh, I was in Ogden, Utah, born in D Hospital. Uh, Lived in Utah for about 10 months, and my family decided to move to California with another family, and been here ever since, been there mm -hmm. ever since. I came up here after I retired. What did your father do? My father uh, was in the wholesale grocery business as he became an adult. I guess I should preface this by saying that he was a very devout Mormon at, a, at the time and did a three-year overseas seas tour, went to England, Scotland, and uh, Wales, and was there when World War I started. So he stayed and finished his tour in the British Isles, then came back and went into the wholesale grocery business with his father, and that landed and lasted until he married and came to California. Mm -hmm. And in what? California, he bought a grocery store and a meat market uh, in Hermosa Beach and did that until the uh, depression hit. We lived there. Uh, he had started a cash and carry store and there was a factory not too far from his store and uh, folks couldn't pay the bills and when they couldn't pay the bills, he couldn't pay the bills so he closed the store and went to work for the MJB company and ultimately was their assistant manager in Los Angeles. Your mom, did she uh, have an occupation? Yes, my mother was uh, seven years younger than my father, and she was a concert pianist. She'd gone, I forget which conservatory, I'm not even sure that it was Utah, but it, she went to a conservatory and was there as a young girl and was there for about three or four years. And went back to, uh, she was not from Ogden, she was born in Canada, and came down through Idaho and wound up in Ogden and married my father. And how it happened, I really never was told the story, but they did get together. And she, uh, she played in Southern California for a number of years until we left there. And she concertized and played in a, um, with two pianos in a, in a quintet. And they would put, in, put on afternoon concerts on the weekend. And uh, we had some very close friends that were doing that at that time. She did that for a long time when we moved to Carmel and uh, she taught as well as uh, 
having the opportunity to concertize. She was a fine pianist. Did she ever uh, teach you to play? Did you? Yes. Yeah. I started when I was about five or six, and uh, I guess I took lessons for close to six or seven years. Um, when we moved to Carmel from Los Angeles, it was all the excuse I needed, I think, to not practice anymore. <laughs> and I'm sorry to I I still uh, played up until a few years ago. I could read music, but I am afflicted with Dupuytren syndrome in my hands. And when they close up like fists, and I, as an adult, I just wouldn't even look at the piano. Mm -hmm. Now your dad, unfortunately, uh, passed away somewhat early in life. Huh? He was 42. He died in 1937. Um, when he was in the grocery business in Hermosa Beach, he went to Southwestern Law School for at least a year and maybe a little more than that, but it just didn't work out for him. Two of his brothers were attorneys and they'd both gone to Harvard. Um, in fact, I think all the brothers except my father went to uh, Harvard two of them to Harvard Law School and one of them to Harvard Medical School. Uh, one of the other ones became the administrator of the hospital where I was born. It was, it was quite an Evans project. Mm -hmm. Do you have many memories of living in Hermosa Beach or were you too young? No, I have quite a few memories of living there. It was <clears throat> a very small town in those days and uh, my father's store was up from the beach about six blocks or more and I, I have one specific memory I don't know why but uh, I had been I think I was in the first grade and I'd come home from school and decided to go down to the beach and I got involved with some other kids doing something on the beach and didn't look at the sun going down or I didn't have a clock and I guess my dad and mother got kind of worried and they called the chief of police who was a friend of theirs and they got him out looking for me and by that time I was wandering home. It was getting dark and as parents would, uh, they both were delighted to see me but it didn't prevent me from going into the bathroom with my father and getting his razor strap laid across my bottom. Uh, just enough to make me think about it and I never went off and didn't tell anybody again. But I, I don't have a lot of other memories except going to the beach. My, I had a cousin that lived in Pasadena and he'd come stay with us and we'd go down and, and uh, I have a friend who's still alive, a, a lady. Her husband died a couple of years ago and she was 10 days younger than I and our families came to California together and she used to come and stay and we'd go down on the beach and it was a great beach in those days, not now. In those days, a trek from Pasadena to Hermosa Beach was quite a trip, wasn't it? It was a long trip. Yeah. So you'd come over and spend a couple of days, and I know when I'd go out to Pasadena from there, I'd plan on staying with my uncle, who was an attorney, and my cousin, and I had two lady cousins, and it was a, a nice outing for me. What brought you to Carmel? Probably my father's health. Um, after his business closed, he went to work for the MJB company and then became the assistant manager for Southern California. And about a year before he died, he started having strokes and minor heart attacks. He was born with what was then called Bright's disease. It was a kidney disease. And at that time, there wasn't any real known cure for it. Uh, but his health deteriorated and my mother had family in Carmel. Uh, most of her aunts and uncles lived there. Uh, lots of her cousins were there and it was a small town. And it was a center for the arts. And we thought if my father went there, it would be quiet, more peaceful for him and it didn't work out. He continued to have strokes and heart attacks and died. Uh, so what was Carmel like in those days? Carmel, when we first, well, I first went up and visited when we lived in Southern California and would stay with uh, my mother's uncle Mike and his family. And some of his daughters were not a great deal younger than my mother, but we would stay. And they'd drag me along and get down to the beach and the uh, sandbars would be exposed. Uh, 
the town was tiny and about half the streets were sand. Um, when I got into high school, I think the population of Carmel was about 800. I used to say 800 if you counted the cot cats and dogs, but it was really a small town. Uh, very arty though, and they had, uh, the arts were open to everyone who wanted to take them. Music and art, photography, uh, whatever, whatever art intrigued you, you could find it in Carmel. As I understand, uh, you mentioned you had a lot of family, and some of the family were actually developing in Carmel. Is that correct? My mother's uncle, Uncle Michael, Michael James Murphy, he was known as MJ, <clears throat> a big burly Irishman, and uh, he owned a lumber yard and a construction company, and I think up until about 1940, he built at least two-thirds of all the houses in Carmel. Uh, you know the bridge down the coast over the Little Sur where they used to shoot the automobile commercials? Mm -hmm. He built that. Mm. Um, and that was done with, in the old days with a Fresno scraper and mules. And they had to build the road to get down there. Mm -hmm. So it took a long, long time. Um, he was a very interesting man. As I think most of my mother's family were. And my father's family were the other kind, but they were very interesting too. They, they were more into the educational aspects and use your mind and not your body to make a living. I didn't always take their advice, but... <laughs> <laughs> the, the old Murphy home, is that still there? The original Murphy house, the first one that was built, uh, somebody researched it. This was back in about, oh, maybe 1980 two or three, uh, they found it and bought it, and they moved it from its side up to a site at about uh, Lincoln and, and Sixth, I think. Um, and they brought it up to code, fixed it, painted it. It was just the way it was originally. And that was a single wall construction. The doors were single walled. Um, and they put docents in and they showed them. The house is still there as far as I know. I haven't been down there for, oh, I think about 93 or 4 was the last time I went down. Mm -hmm. Now, as a young boy, you were pretty industrious. You uh, had a number of jobs, is that right? When we got to Carmel, uh, I started working. I was about 14, I think. Um, I first got a job sweeping out the wood mill that my uncle owned uh, at the lumber yard and that was a evening job. And then I worked in a drug store on the main street of town. I'd go in there in the evening and clean that. And as I progressed I went to work in grocery stores and then pretty soon I'd come home from school in the afternoon and do the deliveries. They delivered in those days. Um, had a pickup truck and you put the boxes and the bags in the back of the pickup and it was an interesting time. I'd had to acquaint myself with the people that lived there and where they were because you didn't have street addresses. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you didn't always have a, a name, but if you knew where they were, you could find it. <laughs> but it was fun. I, uh, I did that until, uh, I guess I, when I came up to Reno to continue a flying project, I was working in uh, Hallett's grocery store and I did all the buying for him when he was out. Mm -hmm. And I was paid the handsome sum of $32 a month. Uh, <laughs> and that's about what a full-time clerk with a family would get. Wages were very low in those days. Yeah. Now, when you were living in Carmel and you went to high school, uh, you actually had to go somewhere else for high Monterey. school. Monterey. We had Monterey Union High School. It was a union district and it took in uh, all the way down to Big Sur, uh, Carmel Valley, wherever anybody lived. Um, the little town out by what is now Fort Ord, and as far over as the border of Castroville. So all of our students came from there and Carmel. How did you get to school? I had a Model A Ford, and if I had enough money to buy gas, I'd drive that over and take a bunch of kids with me, and if I didn't, 
I'd go uptown to see if anybody else was driving over, and if not, we'd take a bus, and if I missed the bus, you'd stick your thumb out and see if somebody wouldn't stop and pick you up and take you to Monterey. Were there very many cars in those days? Not very many. Very few, really. Uh, there were... We had a car. I had a Model A. Uh, but we had a car because of my father's employment in Southern California. He had a, a panel truck that they supplied, and then they bought a car. But in Carmel, uh, we were lucky to have had that car because very few people had cars. The trucks that my Uncle Mike used to haul building supplies around with were hard rubber tired. How did the uh, Depression affect you? I think it made me appreciate the value of, uh, of your earnings. And it made me a little, probably a little more industrious than I might have been. Uh, I didn't expect my family to give me anything. I, I worked for it. And most of my friends were that way. The only problem with that was that it kept me from participating in a lot of uh, sports activities at school. Uh, I did play golf and I did play tennis. Uh, but they came at different hours and I could still get back to Carmel to work. After high school, you uh, went on to a junior college, is that right? Went over to Salinas. I at first told my mother that I want, this was in 1940, I wanted to go to uh, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo because they had a, a great flying program and a good aeronautical school. And I'd by that time gotten the bug. Um, in fact, I got it very early. My father took me out to Alhambra when I was, oh, I don't know, six, seven, maybe eight years old. And one of his friends owned an airport, and he, this fellow had been in England and had flown with the RAF. And I got my first ride in an old Jenny with him. And I loved it. And so that lasted a long time. And that's why I wanted to go to San Luis. But she didn't want me to get that far from home. She had a, My sister was three years younger. And uh, my mother just couldn't cope with a lot of things, uh, having lost her husband. So I decided to go to Salinas Junior College. And I went there for the year 40 and 41. And in 1941, I took a number of courses involved in flying, meteorology, structures, uh, and a lot of math. And then we had a flying course. And I got to fly the Piper Cub, and I got my first pilot's license in about November of 1940. Mm -hmm. But then the war came along, and instead of going into a secondary program at Salinas Junior College, the president advised me to go over to Reno and enroll in UNR because they had the same program here. Uh, when I came up, I only took the courses that were related to the flying courses. Uh, I think I'd had enough of the other stuff at the time. <laughs> I just <laughs> decided it was more fun to fly. Uh -huh. So I, I flew up here. I came up in uh, it was about January or February of 1942. And I stayed until I finished the secondary course. And I uh, got my limited commercial license. and. Then went back down to Carmel. Uh, I probably would have continued flying commercially. I was ferrying airplanes for a Carmelite who was buying them up on the West Coast. And I'd fly one, and he'd fly one, and he'd fly them down to the airports that he owned in Tucson and in uh, Fort Worth, which was quite an exciting deal for a young guy who was only 19 years old. Or he, I can imagine, and, and yeah. of course in those days, uh, the, the airplanes were not as sophisticated as they are today, right? The two airplanes that I, that I recall flying were, were Luscombs. And it was an all-metal, single-engine, side-by-side Seder. And it was a pretty, a pretty good little airplane, but we didn't have anything sophisticated like today. This was a tail dragger. You didn't have a tricycle gear. and. Um, the fellow that I went down with, his name was Clampett, by the way, and uh, he, he uh, and his family at one time owned the, the uh, hotel down on 8th and San Antonio. Um, doesn't make any difference what the name is. My memory seems to split every now and then. Sure seems sharp to me. But uh, I flew that two or three times. While I was doing that and having a great time, we'd always get a compartment to come back on the train on. 
And then he'd start planning another trip and tell me about it. And I got a letter in the mail one day that said, greetings. I, didn't lo I no longer had a college exemption and I'd forgotten about it. So I went out to Mather Air Force Base and signed up to go in the aviation cadet program and be a full-fledged pilot. I probably could have been a service pilot because I had about 350 hours of flying time and, and a limited commercial license, and that was good enough to become a co-pilot in one of the um, C-47s or a DC-3, whatever you wanted to call them. But me, I didn't want to do that. Let me take you back a moment back to uh, the uh, junior college in, in Salinas. Uh, you were working at that time, were you not? Mm -hmm. What What would type of work were you doing? When I was in Salinas, I was working in a grocery store. And that's when I would work. I, my classes, I think, were Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So I had Tuesday and Thursday off. And I would use the library in Carmel to study. And uh, by that time, I had flown B-17s. I'd been through the entire B-17 engineering school, which took a year. Uh, so that going back to take basic courses was really kind of not interesting to me. So I took my time off and I just worked in the grocery store, made money, and I built up my bank account. And uh, I kept flying uh, with Bob Clampett. And I don't know whether he was related by blood to Bobby Clampett, the golfer, or not. But they were real estate developers in Carmel, and he was a nice guy. So you joined the Army in uh, 1942. Mm -hmm. And uh, by that time, you'd had a lot of flight experience. Uh, I had. What? Uh... So when I, when, when I first went into the aviation cadet program, I went down to uh, Santa Ana and did the pre-flight school for the it was before you, you started flying. They teach you how to march and how to clean pots and pans and clean your room and make your bed and all the stuff that goes with it that was pretty good to shape a, a young guy. And it, the old army system of over and over and over again worked. Pretty soon you just did it naturally. So then I was assigned to King City, which wasn't far from Carmel. It's, uh, about 45 miles to Salinas and then just 25 miles over to Carmel from there. And I thought that was pretty lucky for me. Um, but we were flying open cockpit Ryans. It was a low wing monoplane. And it was less power than what I'd been flying up here in Reno. I flew the Waco YPF. It was a biplane. And it had uh, 225 horsepower right cyclone. And Ryan had a 165 horsepower engine, and you had to cheat with it to do a lot of the aerobatics. Um, and you could do that. Um, but you had to fly for a while to figure it out. So the instructor asked for people with prior time, and he'd been in college, and he'd taken CPT, and he had basically the same amount of time I did. I had a little few more hours than he did. So he said, I'm going to fly with you first, and we flew, and I took it off and landed it, and we went out and did a couple of snap rolls and a, a loop and found out how underpowered it was, and he said, okay, I'm going to turn you loose, and I'll fly with you when you have to take a jet ride. <laughs> so I went out, and I flew by myself every day. So were you one of those thrill seekers? You like to do those barrel rolls and that sort of stuff? Every young guy that goes into flying, unless he gets airsick, wants to do that. <laughs> I can guarantee you. It, it was fun. Uh, it was fun when we did it out here. Out of We flew out of what was called the Reno Sky Ranch on Pyramid Boulevard. And uh, I was being introduced to the aerobatics part of it flying. And we were sent out over Pyramid Lake to do it. And there wasn't a soul that lived out there. There wasn't even an, a smell of an Indian. Uh, you know, they own it and run it now. And it's a very profitable operation for them. It's a beautiful lake. But I, oh, a few years ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago when I came up here, I was thinking, you know, we have to go over there and do all this stuff with the airplanes and you're out there by yourself. What if I'd had to bail out? It was one heck of a long walk back down to <laughs> where we, right. we were. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that every 
young pilot likes that sort of thing. And sometimes, even with a B-17, it was a way to spin off some of the uh, tension and the tightness that came from combat. Any, uh, other than in combat, any close calls when you were doing these, uh, this other fly? Mm hmm When I was out here at the Pyramid, Pyramid uh, Highway, Reno Sky Ranch, I ran out early one morning. Uh, there was two things. One didn't involve me except getting a guy out of an airplane, but the other one did. And I pulled the engine through and I got it all set and turned the switches and I pulled the prop and it started and asked somebody to come pull the chocks for me. And I got in and I hadn't strapped my parachute on. And I was in such a hurry to get off, I didn't do my safety belt, my seat belt. So I taxied out and took off and headed out from Pyramid Lake all by myself. And the first time I rolled it up like this, I felt myself starting to go out. And youngsters can think things just as much as old <laughs> folks, I'll guarantee you. But I spread my legs, hit the sides of the cockpit, and hung onto the stick. And I rolled that sucker out as fast as I could. And I never forgot to put my safety belt on, <laughs> seat belt on after that. I but can that, imagine. The other one, there was, we had some Luscombs out there, and they had a primary program, and they were used in that. And there was a young fellow, uh, as I recall, he was from San Francisco, and he was younger than I even, and was taking the primary course. And he went out about as early as I usually got there, and he was pre-flighting the airplane, and he forgot to take the aileron wind locks off. You screw them on with where it goes over the aileron and the wing, and they make them flat. And it's tightened on, and you usually take those off first. He forgot to take them off, and he took off with his luscom, and a little tip of wind went like this, and he wouldn't come back. And he had the presence of mind to throttle it back and not let it climb. And finally, he just turned the switch off and pulled the throttle clear off and let the wing hit the sagebrush, and he cartwheeled. And uh, we went driving over there, and Two of us, uh, from the only the owner of the flight school and I were the only other people there that morning. It was really early, and we got him out, and he was only bruised, scared stiff. And they took him back, and uh, he put him in an airplane and took him up dual. And I don't recall whatever happened to him, but I don't think he stayed with flying. <laughs> yeah, I can understand. Now, you actually flew some missions uh, when you were in the service, correct? Right? Oh, yes. I... Uh, when I finished and graduated and got my wings, I'd been flying twin-engine aircraft as well as single-engine and went to uh, Hobbs, New Mexico for a B-17 transition, and I was quite unhappy about that. I, like every young guy, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I thought I was going to go to P-38s, but I wound up flying B-17s. <coughs> and while I was in Hobbs, I, I spent... Uh, four months in ground school and four months in flying. So I knew as much about the airplane as you could possibly know if um, you weren't some kind of a mathematical genius. Um, and we had one of those. Um, he figured out you could loop the airplane. Mathematically, it would take the stresses, and he did it. And uh, they almost caught him <laughs> uh, when he Finally pulled out of it, he was so close to the ground that he ran his wheels, they were down. He put those down to slow the thing down. <laughs> ran it through the top of a bus. Oh my. Got paint all over the tire. Oh. And he, he swore up and down he wasn't over there, hadn't done it, and they believed him. <laughs> but he, had, he was uh, one of my math instructors from Salinas Junior College, and he went through the CPT program with me. It was, he was really a brain. The guy was just smart as he could be. But I finished B-17s, and then I trained my crew down in Piot, Texas, uh, which is just a cross street out in the sand dunes. Uh, railroad went through, and I think there was a post office there. Uh, and we were there for 12 weeks. And then I went up to... Uh, my crew and I went up to uh, Nebraska, what the hell was the name of the town. It was where the factory was, and we picked up a new airplane. And I test flew it with my co-pilot, and 
we put the crew on board and then we headed overseas and I flew it from Nebraska, Bangor, Maine to Gander, Newfoundland and then to Nuts Corner Island. Mm. And they took the airplane away from me. You can fly an old one. Mm. That's what happened when you'd, you'd take these new ones over and the older pilots would get them. And uh, When I went over, I had to fly five missions as a co-pilot for a seasoned pilot so that you could see what it was all about and see how terrified you were going to be. Uh, first time you see all that flak in the sky, uh, it's frightening as hell. And on my first mission, the airplane on the right wing of the lead plane that we were flying on the left wing of had one of my classmates flying as the, the co-pilot. And I just looked over at him a minute ago or a minute before and looked away and was watching where we were going and I felt the airplane go up. They took a direct hit in the bomb bay and just vaporized. Mm. So those kind of things you had to get used to experiencing and seeing. And uh, luckily, I didn't have any of those happen to me. Excuse me, just a second. Ready? You uh, you actually got a special flying award, did you not? Yeah, I have, I had a few and I got the Distinguished Flying Cross in October. The citation says extraordinary achievement and that's really what it is. Uh, it, it takes a full set of, um, of brassmans, I'll tell you sometimes. And uh, we had been on a mission over near Merseburg outside of Berlin and uh, they knocked off two engines on one side. Uh, luckily, we didn't burn, and so I started dropping back as we got off the target and let down and let down. Finally flew that sucker all the way back across the channel and landed it at our base. I uh, wasn't sure I was going to make it, but we made it. And uh, So I think the, the survival was the extraordinary achievement. How uh, did you deal with the fear? Oh, that's what your training is. Some people that were over there never did handle it. I, I had to fly a co-pilot after my co-pilot certified him as a commander. Uh, there was one co-pilot nobody wanted to fly with, and the guy was just hysterical. And if you let him grab the radio, he'd press the button, and he would never let go, and you couldn't talk to anybody. And uh, I didn't know how bad the man, poor man was, but I volunteered to fly him his last five lesson, as missions. And uh, the first time out, he was doing that, and I grabbed the microphone and reached across and grabbed it out of his hand. And I pointed at one of my engine instruments that measured the oil pressure. I said, get down there and watch that thing. And I yelled at him because you can yell across the cockpit grabbed his head and put it down, and he stayed inside the cockpit the entire mission. So I had to fly it. I didn't have a co-pilot that I could have relieve me and fly the airplane. And they, those old B-17s, you know, they drove like a truck without electric uh, power steering. Uh, they, were, they were hard, and you had to be young and strong to do it, but it was a marvelous airplane. So he stayed in the cockpit. He put his head down there and just didn't move it. And I figured that was a good way to keep him for five missions. So we did his five, and he got to go home. How long were you flying in combat during but, the war? Uh, from June until November, 35 missions. Uh, some of the worst ones were the low-level stuff we did. We had to help the troops out in France. And there were three cities where they got bottled up, and we'd go in at 10,000 feet. And a B-17 is a very slow aircraft. So we'd indicate 150 miles an hour, go plodding along and bomb on a s smoke marker. And in the meantime, the Germans would just crank their 88s up at you and bang, bang, bang. And uh, that would raise a very high pucker factor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. We'd, I'd come home with 100, 150 holes in the airplane, sometimes with an engine out. And, uh, but we, we only had to do that three times, and I was very thankful for that. Was there ever any sense of hesitation when you were called out to, to fly a, a mission? 
Now it was my turn to go. So we'd go. Uh, England was a strange place to be flying out of where we were because uh, I've, oh, maybe a year ago, I looked at my old Form 5 and uh, on all the missions. And of the 35 takeoffs that I made, I think uh, 22 of them were on instruments, zero, zero. There was just no visibility. And we had lights along the room where you could see. So you just set your all your navigation aids for the headings you wanted, unset them, and then took off down the runway, and your co-pilot would watch and make sure you didn't veer, and you watched your headings and took off and climbed up through the stuff because it always broke in England in the afternoon and would give you a ceiling of maybe 800 to 1,000 feet, and you could come in under it and get home. Mm -hmm. it, you know, this, this is why in those days, this was for young people. It wasn't for old people. Mm -hmm. And I realized that more and more as I got older. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. So you uh, finally left the Army in uh, 1945. What was your rank? I was the only first lieutenant. Uh, we had a, a West Pointer uh, who was our commander, and he wasn't free with any of the promotions. But uh, I had good duty. I flew as the deputy group leader, um, which a lot of my classmates and friends didn't get to do, and, uh, and once I had to take over as the group leader. But it didn't bother me. I wasn't going to make a career out of it. I thought I might at one time. But I was glad to get out, and uh, when I came back and went to Hartnell College, I joined the Air Force Reserve down there, Air Corps Reserve. Um, Hamilton Field would supply us with AT-6s. We'd fly up in an old AT-11 and bring the sixes back down, and we'd fly all weekend and just play games with it. Got to fly for nothing. Mm -hmm. And that was the kind of flying I learned to like. So you came back to uh, the Carmel area, went back to Hartnell College and Salinas. Uh... Well, that came a little later. When I first came back, I got part of my education at Salinas in the aeronautical engineering was engineering. Uh, all the math classes, I, I had a ton of math. And I didn't really know how to apply it as a field engineer, but uh, one of the, our family friends was a civil engineer. And I got a job with him, and he taught me how to do it. He said, your math was all you needed. And so I went to work with him and uh, worked until, well, this was about October, and I worked until... January, and I took off on a cross-country trip, just driving. And I was back visiting my co-pilot, and my sister was getting married. My mother called me and said, you better come home. What type of work were you doing in the civil engineering field? Field, field engineering, uh, surveying. Um, started off by doing two subdivisions, one in Carmel Valley and one over on the Monterey Hill. And he was the engineer, and I was the instrument man, and we hired a brushman. <laughs> we did it all. Hmm. But it was, it, it was interesting. I wasn't going to do that for long. I knew that. I didn't, also didn't want to fly for the airlines. That was going from point A to point B and back to point A again, and I, that didn't appeal to me. A major thing happened in your life in 1946. Uh, mm -hmm. What was that? No. The lady that I married came back from the Navy. Uh, I'd known her. We had sung together when we were in high school. She was a year older than I was. And uh, I started taking her out. Didn't realize that, you know, our ages had neutralized by that time. When I was in high school, I didn't dare ask her to go out. I'd take her sister out. <laughs> but uh, Joyce and I uh, decided we'd get married. I asked her if she'd marry me. and. She uh, didn't hesitate. I thought, boy, you sure took the chance. <laughs> but uh, we got married in June, 46. And oh, shortly after that, in mid-July, we went up to Lovelock, Nevada. And I, being a young groom, I didn't have the good sense to ask my wife if she wanted to do that. Ooh. And uh, I think she held it against me for a little while. <laughs> she was still a good wife. 
that's a big change from the Carmel area to Lovelock, Nevada. Mm -hmm. What took you to Lovelock? Well, I went out there. A friend of mine was uh, one of four men who bought 15,000 acres that were virgin land. It's now called the Nevada Nile. It started off as the Nevada Nile. It was going to be a communal farm with 15,000 acres, and people would raise crops, and they'd live in a little center, and it was all planned by Eleanor Roosevelt. And it probably would have gone, uh, taken a long time, and it wouldn't have been successful, but, you know, history tells us that. But unfortunately for her, Harry Truman was running a Senate investigating committee for um, communist affairs and so forth. It was a big scare. He discovered this thing, and I guess when he told Franklin about it, uh, they just decided to dump it real fast. They closed the office in San Francisco, and they put the 15,000 acres on the market. And this friend of mine from Carmel, he was sort of a surrogate father to me. He was also a flyer, but he'd been a primary instructor, so he didn't have a lot of experience. But he and these other three fellows uh, put in a bid for it and bought it for $50 an acre. Had water rights, and so it had to all be brushed and cleaned and then leveled and then ditched, and then drain ditched, and so I did all the field work on it. I had a crew, and uh, we had a good contractor out of uh, Las Vegas, Andy Drum, and God, he had 30 or 40 pieces of equipment out there for the three years that I was out there. That's tough work, isn't it? It's real tough work. Uh, one of my friends, I sent a picture of my son Matthew and me and Joyce and my mother down to her. She knew me when I was young. And she called me and said, I didn't realize you were so skinny then. Well, I worked it all off. There was nothing left. Yeah. Uh, but it, uh, it was fun. Then toward the end of it, uh, they asked me to come in and run the ranch because the fellow that was running it just took off one day. He was married to my friend's daughter and this wasn't for him. So he just told her goodbye and he left and they had a little girl and I don't know whatever happened to him. His name was McCollum. So I went out and started running the crews that were irrigating and farming and the deal was that once we got all the engineering finished I was supposed to get my choice of a half a section of land and that would be my bonus for completing the project and well, it just didn't work out. Well, but something else did work out, didn't it, that kind of led you in a new direction in your career? How, what was well, it that? Was probably, it was probably a good thing that the other one didn't work out because we tried to buy, I tried to buy a small ranch up there, but it didn't have water rights that were developed uh, and protected. And so Christmas time was coming up in 47, and we had an attorney that represented the four partners and the ranch and did everything that had to be done. He was from here in Reno, and his name was Bill Sanford, and a real nice guy. He went to Hastings, by the way. I say that since that's where I went. But he and I were standing by the fireplace in our ranch house, and we were drinking hot buttered drums. And it was cold outside, and we'd been pheasant hunting. And virtually the next thing I knew, I was in San Francisco talking to Dean David Snodgrass about going to law school. Bill had convinced me that I should do that, and I don't remember uh, him asking me to go to San Francisco, but I remember being there. <laughs> we weren't that sloshed, but we were pretty bad. <laughs> and, uh, and Joyce thought that was a pretty good idea, too. I guess uh, getting out of Lovelock, there was probably not a whole lot to do in Lovelock at the time, right? No. Uh, we had a theater. She taught school before Matthew was born, and... Uh, she loved that. The Indian children out there were about as eager pupils as you'll ever find. Uh, she said they'd come to class, they would be so prepared and so clean, it was just a pleasure to have them. Yeah. But um, luckily, I, we had an airplane handy and we could fly in and out to Reno. And um, Sometimes we'd just take a joyride and fly up to Lake Tahoe and spend a weekend. Mm -hmm. and that was before Tahoe developed. Uh, you have two sons, right? Two sons. Were they both born uh, in No, Nevada? Matthew, the oldest, was born in Lovelock, and Jeffrey was born in Carmel. Mm, okay. 
So you uh, find yourself at Hastings, and I, I have to think back, your dad had actually taken some legal courses and you had some relatives, but up until this point, had you even thought about the law? Oh, I'd thought about it. Every time I saw Uncle Zed, who lived in Pasadena, uh, he talked to me about going to law school and what a wonderful education it would be, and you could use it in so many ways, and then my uncle uh, Joseph in Ogden was the same way. I didn't see him as often, but those two were fine lawyers. But uh, Uncle Zed was like my father. He died rather young. He was in his early 50s. But I'd, I'd been told about it, and uh, you know my curiosity was aroused anyway. And when Bill Sanford said something to me about being a lawyer, I thought, well, doesn't sound too bad about now. <laughs> yeah. Fatten you up a little bit, huh? <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> so, uh, what are your memories of Hastings? They're good. My first memory was that I, when I left Snodgrass's office, Dean Snodgrass, he told me to go back to school for a year. And he said, uh, you'll have enough credits there that you won't have anything in a major, but you'll have enough for a, a degree, and that's enough. So I did, and then I went back and enrolled, and when I enrolled, he knew that I was there, and he greeted me, uh, greeted the entire class, but he greeted me separately one day, and he did the usual speech in those days, he looked to your right and looked to your left, and the one before you and one behind you, and they won't be here necessarily at the end of four years, but most of them won't be here after the first year. And I also had him for my first year contracts. And he was a great one for quizzing you on what the cases were, and you better prepare yourself for classes. And I sat in holy terror of being called on by Dean Dave Snodgrass in contracts the entire year. He never once called on me. But I went in there, I was prepared every day I went <laughs> to class. I think he knew what he was doing. That's great. Any other uh, memories of uh, Hastings? Oh, yeah. Uh, we had, as you know, the uh, in the 40s and 50s, they had all these old timers that had retired from different law schools, been deans, Northwestern, uh, Harvard. We even had, they come across from Bolt Hall. Uh, and they were good. They were really good, but they didn't want to spend a lot of time repeating themselves. And that was one thing I learned when Gordon Shaver asked me to go out and teach a couple of classes at McGeorge. I just couldn't figure these adults sitting there and listening the entire class and then asking the same questions I'd been telling them the answers to before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, um, oh, Professor Frazier, who taught real property, very soft-spoken, and you better not ask him a question about what he'd just been telling you unless it was an offshoot of what the question was. Mm -hmm. I, I think that Hastings was a real fine school. Um, we didn't graduate many, and we didn't have many that passed the bar the first time. I think we graduated 114 out of a first-year class of 800. Wow. And of the 114 that took the bar, I think, 55 of us passed. Mm. Gordon Shaver was a classmate uh, and a good one. He knew Joyce and knew the boys. So we'd gotten together a few times, and so it was, he was fun. He was a really smart guy. You're referring to uh, a... The dean of, of McGeorge. Who was a Superior Court judge in Sacramento for a while. Became a Superior Court judge. Uh, I think he did that for, what, two or three years? Mm -hmm. So you graduated from Hastings mm -hmm. with the idea of going into the law, and mm -hmm. what happened? Did you get a job right away? I had a job uh, availability given to me from my cousin's husband, who knew the district attorney in Oakland. And I went over and interviewed and found that they were going to pay me $225 a month. So I walked back out. I couldn't support my wife even living in a housing project and two kids on that. So I kept working as an engineer. I had a job with E.P. Wilsey and Company in Burlingame, and I worked as a party chief then, and uh, 
I was getting something, I don't know, 420, 440 dollars a month. Uh, it was an hourly job. But one day when I wasn't working, I had a phone call from Lloyd Allen Phillips in Sacramento. Lloyd became a Superior Court judge and a darn good one too. Uh, he and I had been good friends in school and he asked me if I wanted to be an elbow clerk and I said, what's that? I didn't have any idea what an elbow clerk was. So he told me and uh, said that Paul Peake wanted a clerk. So I said, all right, I'll take the train or a bus and come up. He said, come on out and stay with us. So I stayed out at Al's house. They lived out on 40th. And uh, I went in and saw Paul Peak. And this was at the Court of Appeal? The Third Court of Appeal, Dist Third Appellate District in Sacramento. And Paul was a very congenial guy, uh, good humored. I always thought he was smart as a whip, and a lot of other people disagree with me. <laughs> but by golly, uh, he could convey his thoughts with less words than any man I've ever encountered when it comes to writing an opinion and make it meaningful. Uh, I, was, uh, I was a real champion of Paul Peake. I just thought he was great. Who were the other judges in the court at that time? B.F. Uh, Van Dyke uh, was the presiding justice. And he was in, his office was in the middle of the three offices on the first floor. Uh, Andrew Schottke was in the uh, most southern office. Uh, I think that's where you are now. That's the presiding justice chambers yeah. now. That's and right. uh, Peak was in the one that was next to the, what is now, or was, I guess it still is, the clerk's office. And that was it. And there was no offices for the law clerks. How many law clerks were there? Three. And this was in 1953? Mm-hmm. So the court was made up of the three justices, three law uh, clerks, and then... The clerk's office. Um, Lud Enders was the clerk at that time, and I think there were... Oh, he had a... a flunky that fiddled with the machine. I can't even remember what his name was. He was young, didn't get much money. And then Ludd had an assistant clerk. And the only thing I can remember about Ludd Enders is that he played golf. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to gamble with me if I'd go out and play. <laughs> so that must have been a really fascinating time. What it really was. We, the law clerks had our, our positions in the library. Uh, and that library is, I think it's still there. Uh, we had tables between the stacks. And each table had a telephone. Um, I was there, Floyd Gibbert was there, and Jim Thompson. Jim Thompson worked for uh, Schottke. Uh, Gibbert was sort of like central staff, but it wasn't called that then. He was just available to do whatever was needed to be done. And Van Dyke hired a a lady, and her, you know, I can't remember her last name, Margaret something. She became a municipal court judge in Sacramento. And I don't know why Van Dyke did that, but he, he did. I guess she did good memos. But he didn't spend a heck of a lot of time with her. And when he broke his leg, he didn't want her coming out to the hospital bringing him work. So he'd call Paul Peake and ask him if he could borrow me. Hmm. And I'd go out to Sutter and take him all the work that he wanted. And, we wouldn't talk about work, we'd sit and talk about his law practice. Uh, he was a very garrulous man, um, very interesting man. He, uh, he went way back in Sacramento. He, he represented Max Baer and Ansel Hoffman in those days. Um, and those were interesting days. Mm -hmm. uh, he told some pretty hairy stories about him. The mob and some of Max's habits that uh, oh, I think you could probably use them in a, a rated movie. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like? Did the justices get along pretty well? It was such a small operation. It was. Paul Peake spent most of his time um, when he was at Sacramento, would be over in the legislature. You know, he had been the Secretary of State 
for a very short period of time, uh, following which I think he came to the Court of Appeal. Before that, he had been in the assembly. I think that was the order. Uh, he told me one very interesting story one time when they were having an impasse on the budget and they locked the doors, you know, to lock all the legislators in. He was the speaker of the assembly. He picked up the phone. He called the fire department, said, please send a fire truck with a ladder over to the state capitol and told him where to go. And they showed up and put the ladder up. They opened the window and them that wanted to went. <laughs> but, uh, they, were, they were a pretty wild bunch in those days, but Paul was a good legislature and he, legislator and he, uh, he made all the gains for the salaries that the justices and the courts achieved until Jerry Brown cut them back. Mm -hmm. And that was a big cut. Mm -hmm. You know, he got that issue on the ballot and they had it worded in such a way that if you voted against the ballot or for the ballot, it, friends of mine at the Del Paso Country Club, doctors and dentists, thought they were doing me a favor and voting for it. Mm -hmm. I just told them, I said, you cost me $20,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So we did sue uh, Jerry Brown and the state for that. Uh, my name with E was the first last name, so I was the lead attorney, but we had um, the Los Angeles lawyer, who, I guess he's still around, represented us, and he won. Mm. Uh, but they changed the salary. As soon as my term was up, I had to go back to whatever the salary for a court of appeal justice was. Mm. So did you find that your experience as a, a law clerk uh, was, it was a great experience as far as learning the I law? I think it was. It, uh, it told me what one of the processes of law was all about. Um, it didn't particularly open any doors, and I didn't use it that way. Um, I told Paul Peake that I would only be there a year or two at the very most, and I was going to go on because I, I wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be in there in a sanctified place where you didn't see anybody or talk to anybody but other lawyers and the judges. So I stayed a little more than a year, and then I got into the district attorney's office. How did, that, how did that come about? I forget. I think that Paul Peake told me that Frank O'Shea was going to have an opening. Uh, and it was in the civil division. And I said, well, I don't care about that. If I can get into the DA's office, I can get in court, and that's what I want. So I went over and interviewed with Frank O'Shea, and I think Peake called him. I'm, I was never certain of that, but I think he did, and that sort of greased the skid a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I got the job, and... Uh, um, I tried some criminal cases, but I mostly tried civil cases. Uh, they didn't have a county council in those days, and uh, John Heinrich was the head of the civil division, and he knew that I really wanted to be in, in the court. So I, I tried all the, remember the old commitments where people would be found mentally ill and you could commit them to an institution like Stockton? Mm -hmm. And they had a right to demand a jury trial. Well, I had to handle all those jury trials, mm -hmm. which was an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. Did that for quite a while, and uh, never forget one lady. Uh, she didn't want to be where she was, and she was unhappy as heck with her two daughters. And after the jury had come back and said she should stay in the mental institution, the daughters rushed up to grab their mother, and embraced her, and <laughs> this one daughter reached out and smacked her mother right in the chin. She was really goofy. Oh, my. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> the system wasn't a good system, but it was the system at the time. Yeah. Now, it was a very small office, wasn't it, the DA's office back then? Oh, yeah. Um, I think there were about four or five deputies. Um, Edwin Sheehy was the chief criminal deputy for Frank O'Shea, and Joe de Cristoforo and J. Allen Jones, and... Uh, what was it, Doug McDougall or McDonald? Your, your uh, memory amazes me that you remember well, all those. It's hard memories. dredging them up sometimes, but uh, J. Allen Jones and one of the other deputies who later went into the public defender's office uh, were in the DA's office, and uh, they, those two got together and formed a partnership. Kenny Wells was uh, there, I think. Kenny right? Wells came yeah. in, yes. Ken was a, was a damn good one. And then he became public defender. Right. There were some characters on the local just, bench at the time. Just got my missed time.
I really loved that. Uh, and I thought it was a pretty good deal, too, until he landed wheels up down in Mexico. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and his mother was in the airplane. She thought that was a great landing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my <coughs> Anyway, gosh. we're talking about the judges. Yeah. Oh, are you ready? So, Hugh, there were some real characters on the bench in those days, weren't there? There really was. Um, in fact, there were some that made you wonder why they were there. Um, but I, I remember very distinctly about J. Henry, very calm, probably the best probate judge you ever found, but he would do anything that he could to avoid having to have a jury trial. He just didn't want him. I had one with him, and, and it was fun. I think one of the bigger characters was uh, uh, the criminal court judge, uh, Al Munch? Coughlin. Oh, oh, Coughlin, yeah. You couldn't understand him. You know, if you were in the back of the courtroom and you had something coming up, um, unless somebody tipped you off, you didn't know that he'd called the case. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was Irish through and through. And he, he was a character, and there are some very interesting stories about some of them that uh, probably we shouldn't talk about. Well, I mean, one of the stories that you always hear in those days uh, are that uh, during the lunch hour, uh, the judges and some of the attorneys would retire to uh, some of the local watering holes oh, and yeah. would come back sloshed after lunch. Huh? Oh, boy. When Desmond was judge, uh, his law, or his court clerk, ran the court in the afternoon, totally. Yeah. He became my, George Paris's clerk, and he became my clerk. <laughs> Um, Desmond would sit up there and his head would go down and he'd snap it up and he'd just be absolutely wired. Um, he didn't even know where he was. Yeah. And he'd go over to, um, if, he, if he managed to get to the Sutter Club and start drinking there, well, they wouldn't send him back to court. They'd send him upstairs to a room and put him to bed. Um, he wasn't the only one that drank, though. There were others. That actually was part of the culture at the time, wasn't it? It was. It was. Yeah. Um, I was there was a, an attorney in town. I didn't know him well. His name was, I think, Ted Smith. And when I was in the forum building with Art, we'd frequently go downstairs, and you go through the bar of the Modern, and then back was a nice little restaurant. They had good food. But you'd go by the bar, and Ted would be sitting right at the end of the bar, and he'd have a glass of either gin or vodka in his hand. Hey, Ted, how are you doing? Fine. You ever give up drinking? I haven't had a drop. Yeah. He'd have this thing and he just, he finally drank himself to death. Yeah. So you were in the DA's office for about two years? About two years. And you decided to leave. What, uh, what I, brought that about? Oh, I didn't want to be there forever. I wanted to get out in the practice of law. And I was one of those strange critters, I guess, that wanted to do that. And... I started asking around, just listening to see if there was something going on, and I don't know why, I think I saw Tom McBride at lunch one day and asked him, and he said, yeah, I'm going to have to need somebody. I'm in, in the assembly now. So we made a deal, and uh, I went to work for Tom. I worked there for about well, 10 months, I guess. Just didn't work out. What? Uh I had I had a conflict of personalities with his partner. Uh, I, I didn't have any res particular respect for his abilities, and I didn't respect him taking advantage of what I was doing either. So I just, rather than cause dissent or discord in the com in the uh, in the partnership or in the practice, I just told Tom I was going to leave. And at that time, Art Isinger was upstairs and on the seventh floor of the Forum Building, and he wanted to leave. So we started talking together and decided to form a practice, and we had a pretty successful practice. Now, uh, you've actually had a practice, and we'll get on to this later, but uh, Tom McBride went on to the federal court. He became a federal judge. Mm -hmm. And Art Eisinger, who you mentioned, went on to become a judge. You went on to become a judge. Tell us a little bit about your practice with Art. Well, Art and I did uh, what you had to do to survive in those days. He, he handled a lot of... Um, domestic relations cases. 
um, traffic cases, and he was in Jim McDonald's court quite a bit. I did more real estate law, zoning, and that sort of thing than anybody in town. I, was, I had been the advisor to the commission, and it was very easy. And I, In fact, I had written the planning code for them before I left, and it was easy. It was just one of those things that, you know, people came to me and thought that I was good. I could charge a fee, and I didn't have to listen to some whining wife <laughs> bitching about her husband or vice versa. So, uh, or a custody battle. So I did that, and then we got uh, quite a few personal injury cases. Uh, Art had a connection with one of the companies, and uh, I wasn't particularly interested in that, but I was interested in getting plaintiff's cases. And so we had several of those. I remember the first one I ever tried, I tried against Bob Memring. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily I came out with some money, but it was, we had a good practice and we, we were able to afford things. Our practice got better and we had a good staff of, of um, secretaries or as in the case of my secretary, she should have been a lawyer. She was that smart. She could do broke paint like a, but there was just nothing to it. Um, then we, I, we hired a few fellows to come in to work with us. When I was a young uh, deputy DA, I often appeared before uh, Judge Eisinger and you'd go into his chambers and he had aircraft yeah. photos everywhere. Uh, how did that start for him? I have no idea how he got started doing it, but he did, he, and he loved it. Um, so you didn't get him involved then in the air? You, he was already flying by the time you uh, no, were a partner with him? No, we, uh, he wasn't. He, he had just started to fly one Cessna 150s. He had oh, maybe 20 hours, and he'd soloed in the 150, but uh, we had an opportunity to buy a half interest in a Navion, a retractable gear. It was fairly slow, but it was a very stable airplane. And I asked Art if he wanted to do that through the firm. And I said, and I'll teach you how to fly it. So I taught him how to fly it and certified him over to John, John Patterson's group of uh, teachers. And they checked him out, certified him, and he got his license. And so we flew that Navy on for quite a while. We were flying, we were taking a trip down to uh, Mexico, and we landed one night of, in Calexico. Mexicali's in Mexico, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. We landed in Calexico, and the man that used to do crop dusting out in Lovelock was running an airport down there, and I hadn't seen him in years. It was just sort of an old home week, but. He brought the uh, customs man from immigration and some of the law person. We took him to dinner, and all of us going on this trip, I think there were about 15 airplanes. We all coughed up 10 bucks a piece, and they took care of the immigration man and his lady friend. He didn't bring his wife. and. Uh, all we had to do was take off from Calexico the next morning, go over and land in Mexicali. Well, I was flying a Cessna 210 of Patterson's, and Joyce and I got up real early, and I, we decided we'd just get the heck out of there, and we went out, got our kids in the airplane, and jumped over the border, and the system was they'd have a man standing out on the ramp, and you'd taxi by him and either open your canopy or lift your window stick your hand out and he'd give you all your clearances to go on to down in Mexico. And that was all there was to it. Otherwise, you'd spend the day going through red tape in Mexico to get there. Hmm. Well, Art wasn't the first to take off and after we got our papers, Joyce and I headed down toward Mazatlan and I was probably 30 minutes out and I was still tuned into the, sh the tower and I heard this Spanish accented voice, ay, ay, ay didn't have his wheels down. And I thought, oh, God, I'll bet that's Art. <laughs> so I wheeled around, came back, and sure enough, there's the Navy on sitting on the runway. And the gear was up, but this Navy on had two great big weights, counterweights, on the back of the flaps. And they hung down below the belly of the airplane, the way it was built. And the prop stopped vertically like this, so the bottom end turned under. 
these two weights hit the runway and they just skidded to a stop. When they fixed the airplane, they didn't even have to be paint the belly. Wow. Um, but Art's brother was the head of the uh, highway patrol in Calexico. So he came right over and he expedited getting the airplane out of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And they fixed it down in Calexico. But Art, Art was a real good partner and he was a real good uh, pilot. He, he listened. I, he used to do some things that I'd hear about and I'd have a talk with him and tell him, don't ever do those again. Now, uh, in 1967, um, you uh, started another firm, right? 66. 66. I got together. In 66, uh, I was up fishing in Canada with my wife and two sons. And uh, when I came home, Art was not in the office, and my desk was piled high. He'd become a municipal judge. He'd some, I forget how it, how it went, but it, it was uh, sort of canoodled through... Um, the judge and Art, and Art, Art made some kind of a declaration uh, that almost precluded anybody else running. And as it turned out, as you know, he was a municipal judge forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and he ran a good court over there. Um, so you're away, and you come back, I don't, and he's gone. I don't have anybody there. <laughs> so I called, I called Herb Jackson. I'd heard he was looking to go out, and uh, I'd known Herb. I, I knew Herb's father better than I knew him, but uh, he came over and we chatted, and uh, I told him all I had on my desk, and I said, this has to get cleaned up, and I'll take part of it, and I need to have somebody help me, so we did, and we finally worked out a, a deal on it, and then when... And then, he, and then so you brought in some fella, Anthony, Anthony Kennedy. Anthony Kennedy, right? yeah, he's a... Uh, He's on some court of a, sort of a federal court now, I think. <laughs> Tony, uh, Tony was a young guy, and I had never met him. I knew his father. His father used to practice in the foreign building where I was. And <clears throat> Herb said, I think he'd make a real good partner in this firm. And he talked him up to me, and we spent a lot of time talking about it. So I said, all right. He said, but he can't come downtown. He's just had retinal surgery. He had a detached retina, and they had to sew it up, and they had to blindfold him on both sides. He couldn't take the blindfolds off. His mother had to help him with his clothes, and um, Mary, I think, was teaching school. So we talked, and it sounded as though Tony would not only be a good addition, but he would have a source of practice of, as well, that we could supplement the practice that I'd already developed. His father had a lot of stuff laying around, and that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, he taught at McGeorge, and the only drawback with Tony is that he didn't have, at that time, any court experience. He'd first started to practice back in New York, and he was a securities lawyer. I think his mother got the job for him some some way, you know. Sis was quite a gal. Uh, so when he came into the firm, he one day, oh, he'd been there a year or two, and he came in and said he had a case that was going to be a problem. And it was a constitutional case. Well, this was right down his alley because he was teaching constitutional law at McGeorge. And he told me what the case was, and you may remember, but about 68 or 69, there was a bullfight thing coming to Sacramento. And it was supposed to be a bloodless bullfight. And the, I don't know, League Against Cruelty to Animals or something got up in arms about this thing and they were going to put a stop to it. Tony said it's free speech. So they got to him, the, the, the people that were going to put it on, and and they had been sued by this other group to enjoin it. And Tony kept me advised of what he was doing. So it came time to go to court, and it was on a motion for a temporary injunction. And it was before Irv Perlis. Well, Irv knew Tony. I mean, he knew he was out at McGeorge, and uh, I don't know how much more Irv knew about him, but Irv was a good judge. 
damn good judge. He was a very understanding man, too. Because Tony stood up, and when it came his turn to argue this thing, I had told him what to do and how to comport himself and to approach it in a very logical and quiet tone. Well, he got worked up, and pretty soon he was going like this at the judge. He was teaching a class, and it was beautiful to watch. It really was. And Perlis listened, and he listened to the other side, and he says, your request is denied, and you might as well submit the whole matter to me because you've argued it all. <laughs> and they did, and he denied their, in question for, their request for the injunction. And so when we got back to the office, we were down on uh, Capitol Mall by then, and went in the library, and Tony said, well, how did I do? I said, Tony, the only thing I can tell you is that if you're going to be in court again, quit shaking your finger at the judge like a bunch of classroom kids sitting out in front of you. Keep your hands in your pockets, but you did fine. <laughs> and he did. He, he did a great job. He, you couldn't ask um, for anybody with more knowledge about the constitutional issues that can come up in the court on a variety of things. I don't know if you, you I used to have it here. My son gave me a copy of the New Yorker, and there was a great article in there about Tony Kennedy on how he uses his European experience in analyzing some of the cases that he gets into. And I thought it was very, uh, very pointed. It didn't say that he relies on it, but he used them to analyze what you could do with our Constitution. Mm -hmm. He considers, considers the Constitution a living thing. Mm -hmm. I don't totally agree with him. I partially do. But I'm yeah. not the expert. <laughs> now, during the time that you were with uh, Evans, Jackson, and Kennedy, uh, you also were on the State Bar Disciplinary Board for a while. Yeah, for three years. How was that experience? That was a wonderful experience. It really was. I met a lot of fine people. Um, the system now in the state bar, as you know, is entirely different. They have a state bar court. Uh, at first, I didn't like that because most of them were law students they'd hired, or law graduates, and they'd had no experience and really didn't understand the depth of some of the problems they'd run into. But I read the uh, disciplinary portion of the journal when it comes out, and that's about all I look at. And that they're now doing things the way they ought to be done. But I, in those days, there were 15 of us. It was like a second board of trustees. Only our only jurisdiction was in the discipline of lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were autonomous. The state bar board of governors had nothing to say about it. And our decision went straight to the Supreme Court. So we'd get a case, uh, and before it was argued, we'd have all the briefs and things sent out to the different members who were going to take that particular case that day. So you only had really one to do every month. If, you were, if we were loaded up, then for about three days, you'd have one a day. And do a memo on it, make a presentation after the attorneys had finished arguing. And then we'd debate the matter. And sometimes the debates got pretty heated. We had, well, when I first was asked to go on the Superior Court, one of the uh, disciplinary board members had a condominium over at uh, Silverado. He was, happened to be from Los Angeles. And he was a, I beg your pardon, from San Francisco. And he was a marvelous man, very gentle. Uh, very kind. He, he could forgive almost anything. Mm. Uh, but he liked being on there, and you'd have the damnedest arguments with him about disbarring somebody. Mm. And some day at times it would take uh, a day or two of hashing to get it all squared away. But I, I met some real fine people. Um, I left there in 1970 or 71. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody gives you a plaque for doing something, so I, I can look at that and see when I left. <laughs> now, well, Hugh, one thing you don't need a ch uh, plaque to check, and that was a very significant event in your life in July of 1974. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, I had a call from uh, Ned Hutchinson. Uh, I had had my name in for consideration as an appointee to the appellate court. 
uh, at the same time that George Paris and Bob Puglia did. There had been, uh, there was a new, one or two new positions. Uh, I guess there were two. And this is where my memory's failing me. I can't remember the Chief Justice at that time, but I remember things about him. But he didn't want to appoint anybody who hadn't had trial experience. There had been an appointment that caused some problems uh, before, and he decided he wouldn't, he would not sit on the confirming board and vote for anybody who hadn't been on the trial court. So Bob Puglia and George Paris got the two appointments, um, both of whom were Democrats appointed by the Republican governor. Uh, I knew Bob and I knew George and I probably knew George better than I knew Bob, but I knew Bob really well from all of his years in the DA's office. He was, he was, he had a fabulous mind. He really, uh, it was good. And you could persuade him off a point sometimes. Not very often, but sometimes. Um, so I was called by Ned and asked if I wanted to go on the Superior Court because the other two appointments had been filled and George leaving created one of the vacancies. And I said, well, I don't really know. I hadn't thought about it. Could I have a few days and give you a call back? And he said, well, call me or Ed Meese. And so I said, okay. And we borrowed our friend's condominium over at Silverado. And we stayed three or four days. And we really talked about whether or not I wanted to do that. There were a number of reasons. Number one, we'd take, I'd take quite a cut in salary when I went over there. And number two, I was going to be married to a clock and a calendar. As you know, that's what the Superior Court's like. And I wasn't sure that that's what I wanted to do because on the Court of Appeal or in private practice, I could make my holiday schedule any way I wanted. And uh, if we wanted to go fishing for a month, we'd go fishing for a month. But we talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. And finally, <clears throat> Joyce convinced me that it would be good. You'd get out from under the pressure and even though you're going to be watching the clock and the calendar and all the things you could talk about. We talked about all of that. We never once even thought about a retirement. Uh, and that probably didn't come to my mind because I knew that if I took the position, I couldn't be there for 20 years anyway. So, came back and I called Ned back and said... What was Ned's position at that time? He was one of the um, kitchen cabinet boys ah. for Reagan. Reagan. Mm -hmm. he, uh, and he was on his judicial qualifications group with Ed Meese and there were two others. I can't for the life of me remember. They're all dead now except Meese. Mm -hmm. um, So and I told him yes. So a couple of days later, Ronald Reagan called me and said, thank you very much, and will you serve? And I said, yes, sir, I will. And the governor personally called you? Yeah. He was very, very uh, concerned about having a secretary call you and somebody else tell you. He wanted to have a personal contact, um, and he did. He did on both occasions. Um, so I sat there. And, very honestly, I was thinking about leaving the Superior Court if something else hadn't come up. I'd been there and I realized that that was going to drive me nuts if I had to keep doing it the way I was doing it. Really? Mm -hmm. So you found it was really not for you, huh? I'd go down to work at 7 o'clock in the morning and I wouldn't get home until 5.30 or 6. I was doing all the law in motion and you know, I could do these things. I'd been doing them all my legal life. but. That didn't appeal to me. Um, I, I knew what the appellate court entailed. I'd been there as a law clerk. And I thought, you know, if I'd been able to do that, I'd have been happy doing that. But I was about to start looking around for some place to light. By that time, Herb was the DA in Sacramento, and Tony was going over to the... Uh, no, he was still there. They didn't, either one of them got it. I, no, they were both still there. I still could have gone back there, I guess. 
I get dates mixed up that way. But uh, as it turned out, before I even started looking around or talking to anybody, they, Frank Richardson was promoted to the Supreme Court in San Francisco. Bob Puglia was made the presiding judge. And there was a vacancy on the court. So I called over and I said, do you want another letter to Ned? And I said, or will my last one suffice? And he said, no, as long as we know you're still interested. And I said, well, I'm interested. So we went through the interview process again. And in the end, uh, I was called shortly before the, well, it was about the 20th or 21st of December. Uh, no, it wasn't quite that late because they, they convened the confirmation committee on, I think, the 21st. And I was sworn in on the 23rd of December. So you were a midnight appointee, so to speak. Absolutely. Uh, in 1974 in December. <clears throat> right. um, there was one other, one of my classmates was appointed to the second district at about the same time. Hmm. And we were the last ones under Reagan. The court at that time, there were seven justices, right? There were seven. Um, that had happened about the time of Paris's and Puglia's appointment. The, the positions had been established. And up until then, there had only been, I think, uh, I guess there were five. And it had been three when I was there mm -hmm. as a law clerk, and it was three for a long, long time. So your legal career started out in the Third Appellate District and uh, ended, so to speak, as a, uh, yep. as a serving as an officer. You went on to private judging, but uh, you ended at the Third Appellate District. Now, that wasn't being a judge. You were just, that was one of those little quirks that happened, and that was fun. But I was, my entire career started and ended on the Third District Court of mm -hmm. Appeal. So can you describe a little bit about uh, the court at that time and how it was during the uh, mid-70s? When I first went on it, they had just the three justices, and they were very collegial. They didn't have any real problems. Uh, Van Dyke was a very astute man, and the Schottke, Andrew Schottke, would get there, but it, he took a circuitous route sometimes. Uh, he was a good judge, uh, and his son Andrew was a classmate of mine as well. Um, and Peek, Peek was kept so damn busy being a legislator or a legislative advocate that uh, he didn't always get a full load of cases, so I did his bidding. I drove him to Reno uh, several times, came over. Um, I did a lot of memorandums for him. And he would take his share. Uh, he didn't want me writing an opinion. He wanted me. He wanted to have a memorandum, gave him both sides of the story and where the strength lay, and where the weaknesses lay. And so I learned how to do that. I I didn't write anything that was going to be in an opinion. But they they worked together very well, uh, and they were people from. Different interests. You know, there was Van Dyke from old legal firm of Sacramento. Um, he'd been there for years, and he knew the ins and outs of the law practice in Sacramento better than anybody. Paul Peek had been a football player in Oregon. As a matter of fact, after he graduated, he went down to apply for a job, and my uncle interviewed him, and he didn't get the job. Mm. Uh, didn't go to Harvard. Mm. But well, it, let, let's fast forward to 1974 when no longer you were a law clerk, you became a justice. How, how was it 74, then? In 74, it was very interesting. Um, physically, the, the chambers were tight. I was down uh, next door to where Bleece is now. There were two little offices over there. One was a library, sort of, and one was the office. And that was all right. I didn't care what I had. I had a place for Beverly. I brought my own secretary over. And, um, I got acquainted with the functioning of the court and the differences of opinion. Uh, there was Bert Jaynes, uh, Leonard Friedman, 
at Regan, Bob and George and me. Who did I leave out? That's seven. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, Leonard Friedman probably was the toughest one for me because he thought that he had known that I would be an ideologue and that I would be voting what I thought it ought to be. Well, I'm anything but that. Um, I never voted my conscience and I didn't vote my political philosophy. If it was written in the law, that that's what you do. That's what I did. I had a welfare case come in and Leonard was on it and I was on it. I was, I was the author. And I wrote an opinion and uh, put the little stamp on it and sent it down to Leonard. And, you know, and by the time he got to it, he came down to my office and he said, uh, are you sure you wrote this? And I said, yep. He said, I wouldn't have thought that would come from you. And I said, why? He said, well, you're, you're an ideologue. And I said, no, I'm not. I said, you'll find that if the law is clear, even if I don't think it's a good law, my God, that's the way it's going to be interpreted. So I think Leonard and I came to an understanding early on that uh, I think the only place that we ever really differed was in one of the Inyo Mono Lake cases. In fact, it was the first one that I sat on. And I thought they were wrong. I thought that they were rewriting the contract that had been entered into as bad as it was between L.A. County and Inyo and... Uh, Mono counties. So I wrote a dissent. And I think the Supreme Court took that case up and they did what Leonard said and they set a table that you could withdraw. And once that was done, that's the law and you can't do anything about it. So the rest of them were easy. But that one, Leonard and I had our little arguments about and he had damn good arguments. Bert Jaynes, on the other hand, uh, was difficult. Because Bert wanted to make everybody happy. He didn't want to make anybody mad. You know, if he could been, if he could have settled a case, he'd have settled it. Uh, Ed Regan was easy to figure out. He just went to his law clerk, and that was it. And Ed was a pretty amenable guy, you know, and he was no dummy. The guy was pretty smart. But he was a politician, and he never got over being a state senator. Uh, we were good friends, and I loved him. I thought he was a great guy, and he did, a, he did Bob and me a, a great favor when he stayed on past his retirement date so that Jerry didn't get another appointment. And Bob worked on him, and I worked on him, and he stayed. Um, we didn't have a lot of real divisions on the court. Now, George and I had problems. George was a Stanford graduate, and I was not. George considered himself a literary genius. He didn't think I was. So when my cases would go into George, my God, he would change words, change sentences, never change the result, but he'd get all this stuff, all the changes that had to be made. And one of his favorite authors was from Los Angeles, God, I wish I could remember this. But I got a, a little criminal case assigned to me, and I sent it in to George, and he started marking it up. Well, what I had done is I had taken a case that his pal from L.A. had written, and I almost copied it verbatim, except I changed the names of the people and when the thing happened. And all the structure of it was exactly what George was espousing was the greatest. <laughs> I took it in and laid it on his desk, and I said, George, next time you want to mess up one of my opinions, I wish you'd read it carefully. And I gave him the book and the opinion. And this one, I was next door to him downstairs. And he came back. He said, I was pretty bad, wasn't I? <laughs> I said, yes, you were. That was the last time he and I had a problem like that. Everybody did a little of that scribbling and chasing, changing the syntax of the sentence. That's all right. If you liked it, you did it, and if you didn't like it, you wrote it the way you wrote it. My recollection is you and uh, George Paris always saw pretty much eye to eye as far as how the case ought to come out, right? He and Puglia and I were as close as we could get. Puglia and I had a big difference in one criminal case. 
And uh, that's the only case that I think I ever had him change his mind on. Uh, we battled it over it for several months. But the thing we didn't have at that time was there was no 90-day rule on your opinions. And um, Bert's office got stacked up with with opinions. He got so far behind he couldn't catch up. And um, I don't have a lot of kind thoughts about Bert professionally as a individual. I thought he was a nice guy. He really was a wonderful man. Yeah, yeah he was. He really was. But Bob was a real force, wasn't he, as a as the presiding judge? I Tremendous I force. Um, Bob was probably as much of an expert on criminal law as anybody in the state of California could be, and he had a phenomenal memory. <clears throat> You'd be talking to him about cases, and all. Well, wait a minute now. And he'd give you a citation of a case in the California Supreme Court back at a certain date. And he'd give you the pages of the damn thing. I never understood how Bob could do that, but he did. And because once I wrote an opinion, I, if it was published, I didn't care anymore. That was not something I was going to remember. If I needed to, I could look it up. But Bob had a memory for it. And his memory was, was really good. Uh, and I think that... Some of the judges that came on later uh, were really impressed by Bob because they were entitled to be impressed by him. And well, he, was a, he was a good PJ. The thing that struck me as I was appearing before your court was the collegiality of the court. Even though you might disagree from time to time on different things, I thought the court was an incredibly collegial It court. really was. Uh, it was. It was the same as it was when I was there as a law clerk. Uh, I think the ones that were there when I came on, when we all got along as well as anybody could. We could discuss cases. We could, we could talk about anything, really. And if it was pertinent to what we were doing, that was even better. Um, George and I probably were more alike than any, but I, was, I think that Bob was right in line with both of us. Now, there was a time when you only had uh, seven justices, and really you had much more work than seven justices, and uh, your court became really the most productive of the we were. courts. Well, during that period of time, George Paris got the idea of appellate settlements, and we had the routine cases. Uh, and with those, I think, we handled the calendar as best we could with the shorthanded as we were. Um, and it got even worse when Rose Bird came on the court because she just ignored us. She piled that money down to the other districts and we didn't get second law clerks. We didn't get anything until Bob came up with the idea and we talked it over and then we met as a whole court um, and decided that we'd ask the governor who, and by the way, was not a great fan of, of Bob Puglia's, but they were friends. They got together. Uh, I can tell you a story when we're not re recording about that. <laughs> this is Governor Jerry Brown you're talking about. No, this is, this is Governor Duke Majin. Oh, okay. He went to Duke Majin <clears throat> and asked him if he would set up his budget for the third district court and don't put it under the administrative office of the courts. And don't, we don't want it divided up. We'll do it and we'll manage it ourselves. And Duke said, sure. Well, that got around pretty fast, and Rose Bird called up Monda to have a meeting with our court. And B, Blee, Sparks, Sims, Evans, Puglia, forget who else was, was there, we all agreed. We all agreed that we're going to let Bob do the talking. And Rose laid it all out that this is what I hear. And Bob said, well, you heard right, because that's what's going to happen. She started almost to cry. She was, God, she was upset. She didn't know how to handle it. And finally, uh, Bob got a concession out of her that we would get every penny that belonged in the third district court. And after that, it became very fair. All the districts were, because we were doing more cases than any other district, really, per capita. And we needed help. So Bob got it. Mm -hmm. It was neat. No, that's great. Um, back in those days, uh, for you, it wasn't uh, necessarily all work and no play. You 
had some side interests. I understand you talked about golf. Uh, you got involved with a golf organization. I did. I I had played golf most of my life off and on. I started as a teenager in Monterey at Pebble Beach, and uh, Peter Hay, who was the golf course manager and the executive of uh, the golf course, was also the high school coach. And uh, so we got to play on one of the best courses in the country when we played. But this was when I was young. And then when I came out of the service and started to practice law, when I was in the service, I carried a camera every place I went. And I had a friend in Hollywood who would send me the old Technicolor, you know, the 35 millimeter stuff would come in a roll. And I'd have to load it on the roll that would fit in my old, my real old Argus. It was like a C3, but it was the predecessor. And I'd do it under my blankets on my cot, and I'd load this stuff. So I had some great pictures from overseas when I got home. And uh, I didn't really understand how to frame a picture and how to get the light the way you want it. And sometimes that requires going back several times a day. But that, that became a little bit of a hobby. But that wasn't a time-consuming hobby. I, I got to playing a little golf. Uh, we lived at El Mucero, and then we lived at Cameron Park, and then we belonged at the same time to Del Paso Country Club. And so I played, but I went on the tournament committee of the Northern California Golf Association back in the oh, early 80s or maybe late 70s. And they were called the Redcoats. And what you did, you ran the tournaments with, the, with a director or two from the board and got through their tournament schedule, and it was a lot of fun. You got to know a lot of young guys. And I went from there, uh, a dentist at our club who had been on the board of directors of the NCJ asked me if I wanted to go on the board. And I didn't particularly, but he said, there's a vacancy, and why don't you go out and talk to the director, the uh, president, who's out at Rancho Murrieta today. And I didn't want to do it. My wife called me up and said, you go do it. She said, we'll have a good time doing that if you get on. So I went out, and the president was a printer from San Francisco and a hell of a nice guy. Uh, we talked, and <clears throat> he said, you know, you're going to be one of the oldest guys on the board. He said, you'll probably never get on the executive committee. I said, I hadn't even thought about it. Somebody said that you needed a board member and wanted it from Del Paso, and here I am. So I did, and four years later, they put me on the executive board, and then I became president. Then I became the president of the California Golf Association. And this didn't take as much time as it sounds like. We'd, there was a time when we'd go down to Carmel for a meeting and a tournament, and there would be some other things, but I would use uh, uh, Ralph Drummond's chamber over in Monterey. He had a library, and he let me use his library, and I'd go in and work on the days that I didn't have golfing to do. And so I, when I'd get my work finished, it would be all drafted out in pen, and I'd pick up the telephone and call my machine in Sacramento, and it would record, and Beverly would have it all done when I'd get back. I really, I wasn't available to talk to people, but I was doing the work while I was doing that, and it was fun. And I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed then being on the Poppy Hills Board of Directors. That was the NCGA's golf course in Pebble Beach. Um, I did that for, I think, four years, and I was president for two years. Did you get to know a lot of the pros on the tour? Many of them. Get to uh, play with any of them? Yep. I played with a lot of them. And they were real good friends. Uh, Tom Watson, John Mahaffey, Gene Littler, Bobby Nichols. I have a picture out in the garage where Glenn Campbell and Gene Littler and I went out and played in the rain. Mm -hmm. And we were the only people who went on the golf course that day. And it was fun. Um, we did a golf tournament in Sacramento called the Swing at Cancer, and we made a lot of money for the Cancer Society. And that's how I got to know them, really. I also did the tea announcing for the Anheuser-Busch tournament in Silverado. And when 
they closed that tournament down and moved back to Kings Mill. Joyce and I went back with Vern and Jeannie Peak. Uh, he was the tournament director, and we taught groups how to take care of the first and tenth tee and the eighteenth green when they finished. And we stayed for the full four days, and then we went to Ireland together. Took our vacation over there. So I had a lot of really nice acquaintances out of golf, and I had them out of flying, uh, and in photography, I met a lot of nice people. You, you, some of your beautiful work yeah. right here in your home. And well, they're fun. They, I take little tours every now and then when I sit there at night by myself, and I probably shouldn't do that. Well, that's a good thing. Well, you really have had a, a remarkable career with some remarkable people, both in the, in the law and in golf and other areas. Yeah, I've, I was fortunate. Uh, could have made some early turns that wouldn't have accomplished any of that. Mm -hmm. uh, at one time when we were in law school, I was so despondent about being so dadgum poor with two boys and my wife and she couldn't have anything and I was getting to the age where any older they wouldn't take me on as a co-pilot on the airlines and United was advertising for pilots and I kept looking at that salary and thinking oh gosh we could stop all this and I kept asking Joyce what she thought, and she said, I'm not going to tell you what to do. And so we let my birthday come and go, and that was it. Stay in law school. I have the sense you really don't have any regrets. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do anything differently. I really wouldn't. I, I would like to have had my father with me longer. Uh, I had some of his brothers who were very close to me, his uncles, and uh, they tried to get me on the straight and narrow path when I was young, and they did a pretty good job of it. One thing we neglected to talk about is after you retired, you, real, you stayed active in the court. You did our mandatory settlement conference. For I did the while. settlement conferences for about two or three years afterwards. Uh, you did that for as a volunteer, basically. Yeah, Bob gave me a, an office upstairs, um, and I yeah I think it was about three years. And I had a secretary that worked, and then I had the attorneys started to get not to like to have settlement conferences. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't want to come and they didn't want to submit their statements and that happened all at the same right time. Bob decided they needed that space up there for, mm -hmm. I forget who was coming on as another judge and it was time to go so I did and then I just did the arbitrations and I worked over at the uh, court as a trial court judge. You know they tried a, an experimental program, they did it for, I, I don't know, this four months or six months, um, the county hired three retired judges to come in and try to clean up their backlog. And that's all we did. We didn't do any of the other garbage that had to be done, the law in motion and probate. And so I agreed to do that. They didn't pay you very much. I think it was $400 a day. Uh, but it was good. You were, I was back talking to attorneys again and seeing people and and that was fine. I enjoyed that. Uh, I tried a lot of jury trials over there. Oh, I After that one expired, Bob Bargese kept calling me every now and then to see if I'd come over and sit for a month or he'd have something come up that was going to take a long time and uh, usually uh, I went over and they'd already exercised their challenges and they get up to me. <laughs> they weren't too happy about that. <laughs> Bob Borg was a Mr. Calendar Clerk of the Sacramento County Superior Court and he, right. he pretty much ran the show there. Oh, he, he sure did. Yeah. He was a nice man. Yeah, he was an excellent man and a good, good manager. Well, um, it, it's, it seems to me that your career spanned ordinary time in the law, a lot of changes in the law. What, what are your thoughts oh, yeah. about the direction of the courts? And There were a lot of changes in the law. Um, most of them came about, from my point of view, through the activism of people on the Supreme Court who would choose to be legislators rather than judges. I think that's what caused George Paris to leave the court. He was so mad. Reminds me of one thing. You've probably looked at this case. 
George wrote an opinion, published it, and then wrote a dissent to it because the law required him to do what he did, was doing, but he didn't think it should have been that way, and he wrote the dissent as though that's what it was. And the Supreme Court took it, and of course that's what he wanted. But that's where the changes came, um, both from the U.S. Supreme Court and from the state of California. We had some really strange things out there over in the field of marital relations. Uh, the time that Jerry Lewis represented, I forget whether it was the wife or the husband, the law had not been settled on military retirements at all. There was, no, there was nothing in the books on it. After he concluded the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court, legislated that that's wrong. What you have to do is divide it up and they specified how you do it didn't come from the Congress. It didn't come from the legislative body. They did it. <laughs> it cost Jerry a bunch of money out of his insurance company. He was supposed to second guess that the Supreme Court would do that. Those were the kind of changes I saw that I didn't like. Um, you know, I th judges have a real function in our and and that is to be a judge and to consider a matter for decision by the law that's written. Uh, if it isn't, then you suggest that they do it. I did that once on a settlement conference. I sent the people back. I said, go get the law changed. And they worked the legislature. They got a new law passed. Well, it wasn't my job to wiggle the law around so that it pleased somebody. I would have decided the case right with what the law said, and it, even though I thought it was wrong. Um, but by and large, I think our system of jurisprudence is a good one. Um, I had a phone call from Tom Kennedy not, I guess, about six months ago, and he is the enemy of somebody who thoroughly enjoys what he's doing. He, he isn't in touch with the people except through what he writes. And he doesn't really create any new law. He takes the Constitution. Now, that's the only thing that he'll do. He thinks it's a living thing. And it may be one thing to a certain set of circumstances. And he'll, he'll say that. He's one of the good judges on the Supreme Court. And I think that he's going to be there for a few more years. Well, I saw a picture of him recently. And I thought, come on, Tony, you're looking as old as I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's wearing, I'm sure. I know well, you people in Sacramento, uh, you know, being in Sacramento, you're in the hot seat because the legislature's over there and it's up for you to do all the time. Uh, if they don't like it, somebody's going to go over to the court with a, a writ and see if you can't get them to do something about it. It's not your function, but you get more than your share. Do you still do the sessions? We do. We do. And of course, as you know, being in the 3rd Appellate District, a lot of government laws. That's what I'm thinking that, about that really make it uh, an yeah. interesting job right? yeah so you you know all of you have your work cut out for you and it, uh, it's not something to shirk i'm glad that my tour is finished it's about time to said i didn't plan on having the dog timers but uh, that's the way life goes uh, i really respect you what you do i know you go over and visit with your wife uh, every morning and mm -hmm. read to her and uh, you obviously had a Long and loving relationship. 60 years worth. Yeah. Well, you mentioned about uh, Tony really uh, enjoy, uh, Anthony Kennedy enjoying the uh, job. get a sense that you've really enjoyed your life. I, uh, as I said, I wouldn't change anything I've done. Uh, even going to practice when I started to get this come Superior Court, I could have made a lot of money, but I just spent it all. Uh, we didn't, Joyce and I and our boys, they, the boys were both gone by, well, Matt got ready and Jeffrey waited along, but they were out of we traveling. We, I didn't care money to spend them. Dad together, we had a real good time, and I love it because, no, we can't. Well, I must say, I, one of my most times when I was an appellate lawyer before the third appellate district, particularly, the panel was 
Julia. Ferris. I, I, it was that, great fun. That was my favorite panel too. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm sorry, it's just a delight and a lot of fun to see you today and to talk with you and to reminisce. Scotty, I appreciate that very much. And, uh, you know, I think around the third part when you came, uh, I don't recall anybody else calling you Scotty. I think I one that did that. I had who was the president of NCGA ahead of me, and his last one was Scott. And he was, so I'd meet a Scotland or a Scott, Scotty to me, and that's what you'll always be. Well, that too, because everybody yeah. calls me Scotty. Well, I'm glad. So. <laughs>